We are black and beautiful people. And together we will win. See, see, watu, wazuri, pamoya tu tashinda, pamoya tu tashinda. We are black, beautiful people. Together we will win. Together we will win. Together we will win. Sing it with me. Sisi watu we si watu wazuri pamoya tu tashinda. Pamoya tu tashinda. Sing it. We are black, beautiful people. Together we will win. Together we will win. Together. Season of Kwanzaa, which is from the 26th of December to the 1st of January, seven days one day for each of the seven principles, we respond <coughs> with the principle that corresponds to that day. So today is the 26th of December, the first day of Kwanzaa. So if I would say Habadi Ghani, you would say Umoja Habadi Ghani. And if I meet you tomorrow on Martin Luther King, and I say Habadi Ghani, you would say <laughs> and the day after that, and so on and so forth. So today is the first day of Kwanzaa. So once again, once again, I greet you, Habadi Ghani. One more time, Habadi Ghani. Thank you very much. Give yourselves a hand. First of all, I think we, just, we must acknowledge the pastor and the congregation of this church for opening its doors so we could have this program tonight. Give the St. Augustine Church a good morning. And I want to thank the sponsoring organization of tonight's program. Give them a big hand. I tell you, when Alasia and I were coming down Governor Street, I looked on either side of the street. There was no parking. I said, oh, they got a full house in here tonight. And that's something that you should be proud of. And I'm so glad to see so many people here tonight to celebrate Kwanzaa. This year would mark the 43rd year that I have celebrated Kwanzaa, Alan. I came to Kwanzaa through our great freedom fighter, one who left us this year to join the ancestors, but who must never be forgotten, Brother Amiri Baraka. As my brother said, I started on this path when I was 17 years old. I came out of a student movement in Newark, and I was the spokesman for what was called the Newark Student Federation. And at the age of 17, I was the president of the Arts High School Student Government, and we brought together the student governments from all the other high schools in Newark. And we had a protest for quality education. And we marched down, hundreds of us, marched down on the Gateway Hotel. How many know where that is? The Gateway Hotel across the street from Penn Station. 
and 200 of us got into the Gateway Hotel and we took over the sixth and seventh floors of the Gateway Hotel and we sat in there and we said we were not going to leave until our demands were met and before too many hours passed, all the police in Newark came and all the fire engines came. You know there had been a rebellion in Newark just a few years prior. But the mayor of Newark came, mayor, uh, came and his name was Kenneth A. Gibson. He was the first African American mayor elected in the city of Newark. And he was a product of the rebellion of 1967 because had there not been a rebellion, he probably would not have been elected. So whenever people talk about the riots, let them know that the riots were part of our freedom struggle. And many of these black folk that have jobs in city government today would not have had those jobs had it not been for those uprisings in 1967. So I met Ken Gibson and he said, well look, I will do everything I can to meet your demands if you will leave peacefully. So after sitting in the entire day, we, we did leave. And a few months after that, the mayor's aide, a fellow named Pete Curtin, came to my house. I lived in the central ward of Newark, just a few blocks from where the riot started. He knocked on the door and I answered, and he said, the mayor wants to know if you would be a member of the Board of Education. I was 17. I just graduated arts high school. I'm ready to go to college. I said, I don't know, ask my mother. <laughs> so he talked to my mother. My mother told him to ask him. He's almost grown. He'd make a decision for himself. So I said yes. And on July 1st, 1971, wow. before I was even old enough to vote, I became the youngest voting school board member in the history of the United States of America. And it was just a month after I was appointed to the board. Now let me just say this, that I went to Arts High School, and Arts High School then was on High Street. Today it's Martin Luther King Boulevard. But down the street from my high school was this place called 502 High Street. Actually, the formal name of the place was Hikalu Umoja. That means house of what? Unity. That's right, Hikalu Umoja. And I would get off the number one bus, and I would walk up the street going to Arts High School every day. And as I walked by the place, there'd be brothers out there standing at attention. And I'd come by, and their brothers say, Habani Ghani. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know nothing about Swahili. So we called them the Habani Ghani people because that's, <laughs> that's what they said to us every day. But this was the headquarters of who we at that time called Imam Amiri Barak. And he was the head of an organization called the Committee for a Unified Newark. And it was part of a national organization called the Congress of African People. And the head at that time of the Congress of African People was a gentleman who's still with us today, Maulana Karen. So I came to Kwanzaa through Amiri Baraka. I met Amiri Baraka in August of 1971. And you know, at that time, you couldn't go anywhere in Newark without hearing his name. So I thought when I went to his office, I was going to see this man 10 feet tall. <laughs> you know, well, he might not have been a giant in stature, but he was an intellectual giant. And I didn't get to meet Martin Luther King, and I didn't get to meet Malcolm X, but I'm proud to say not only did I meet, I was under the tutelage of Amiri Barak. I am who I am today because of Amiri Barak. 
And the guiding philosophy of the Committee for Unified North at that time was called Kawaida. Kawaida is Swahili for tradition and reason. And the core of the philosophy of Kawaida are the seven principles. And the holiday, the African American holiday called Kwanzaa, is organized around those seven principles. And I can remember the first Kwanzaa I went to see, there were two headquarters in Newark. There was Hikaru Umoja at 502 High Street, and there was the Hikaru Mwalimu, which was the temple of the teacher at 13 Belmont Avenue, which today is called Urban Turner Boulevard. Now, y'all know where Urban Turner was, right? Who was he? He was the first black elected official in the city of Newark, the first black councilman in the city of Newark. The true story is we actually wanted to name Belmont Avenue Malcolm X Shabazz Boulevard, but the city council, which was predominantly white at that moment, wasn't here. So Urban Turner actually was a compromise, but we wanted to name it Malcolm X. So we didn't name Urban Turner, we didn't name Belmont Avenue Malcolm X, but we went ahead and named Southside High School Malcolm X Shabazz High School, and it's still Malcolm X Shabazz High School today. And if people try and change it back, we're going to fight it. But I remember when I went to my first Kwanzaa, and I was like, Kwanzaa, what's that? You know? And I don't know about y'all, but I can only speak about myself the way I was. I was born in 1953, raised in Newark, 1950s. You know, I grew up on Ridgewood Avenue, number five, right next to the Ridgewood Bar. You know, I grew up at a time when black people didn't want to be black. <laughs> I grew up at a time when if you called somebody black in the 50s, even into the 60s, you were going to fight. We didn't want to be black. We didn't want to have anything to do with Africa. And many of us hated ourselves. And I hate to say this, but some of us still hate ourselves. I mean, why did Maulana Karanga feel the need to have a holiday for black people or that celebrated our blackness. Well, it was because we suffered from self-hatred. See, we did not come here, brothers and sisters, on the Carnival Cruise Line. We did not come here on the Mayflower. In fact, we are not immigrants, most of us. Immigrants come voluntarily. We were taken out of our homeland Africa. We were stolen from our homeland. They stole us, they sold us, and I'm telling you today, they owe us. We want reparations for 250 years of free labor in the United States. or with Africa. I remember when I was a kid, adults would pinch my nose. How many of y'all had your nose pinched? They pinched our noses because our noses are naturally broad and flat to some degree. But we didn't want our broad, flat nose. We wanted that aquiline, straight nose. So our parents were always pinching our noses to make our noses straight. And if you go back and you look at issues of Ebony Magazine, and y'all remember that other one, Sepia Magazine, and Jet Magazine, and they sold bleaching creams because we didn't want our black skin. We wanted 
lighter skin, and if some of us could have found a way, we really wanted to be white. Uh huh? Everybody in the quiet now. I didn't come here to sing you a nice song. I'm not running for office, so I'm going to tell you what I really believe. I remember the boys, we used to get our mother's old stockings. And we cut our mother's stockings and we made what was called a stocking cap. And we go get Nuna or Royal Crown. And we put that Nuna and Royal Crown in our head. And brush and comb that head a million times to it look like it might have some waves in it. And then we get that stocking cap and pull it tight on our head and go to bed. Man, that stock cap was so tight it would leave a line across the forehead. Because we didn't like our kinky hair. We wanted straight hair. We wanted light skin or white skin. We wanted straight noses. And we definitely didn't want anything to do with Africa. We come home on Saturdays and watch the movies that would come on television. You'd have Tarzan movies, and there would be Johnny Rice's mother, Tarzan. I mean, he wasn't just like a strong white man, he could talk to the animals. He could single-handedly defeat a whole tribe of Africans by himself. And he, if he couldn't do it by himself, he would call the elephants and the lions to help him. That's right. This is what we were, and it didn't stop in the popular culture, it went right into school. We celebrate Columbus Day. I don't understand that Columbus Day should not be a day of celebration for those of us who are descendants either of Indians or Africans. Because Christopher, the arrival of Christopher Columbus in the New World is the beginning of slavery That's in right. the Western Hemisphere. That's right. So we didn't want anything to do with blacks. And then came Christmas. And we would all take our children to Bamberger's in Newark. How many of y'all remember Bamberger's? And the little black children would go upstairs on the top floor of Bamberger's and sit on the knee of the white Santa Claus and ask the white Santa Claus for all that their heart desires. And then when they woke up on Christmas morning, there would be all the gifts that they believed that the white Santa Claus brought them, not their parents who had to work two and three jobs to buy those clothes and buy those presents. We even in our mythology would give credit yep. to other people, but thank God people came along like Malcolm X who said, we should not be ashamed of our blackness. We should be proud to be descendants of African people here in the Western Hemisphere. Thank God for Malcolm X. Yep. Thank God for J.A. Rogers. Thank God for Dr. John Henry Thank God for Dr. Ben Malcolm Thank God for all those people who dedicated themselves to try to open our eyes and lift the veil of ignorance from ourselves so that we would not pass this disease. What else can you call it? That we would not pass this disease on to future generations. And I know a lot of you look around and you see that things are still not the way we want them and the media blares out all the crime in our community and everything negative about our community. But I tell you, as I stand here today, I'm proud to be a black man in the 21st century here in the United States of America. Well,
pride out of my heart. And I try to pass this on to my children, who I named two of them, my oldest daughter. They, all my children have African names because of Amiri Barak. In fact, I have an African name. My African name is Adimu Chung. Now, I never changed my name legally. But if you ever hear people talking about Adimu, they're talking about me. That name was given to me by Amiri Barak after I attended the National Black Political Convention in Gary, Indiana in 1972. How many remember that great gathering in Gary, Indiana? Before the convention in Gary, Indiana, there were fewer than 1,000 black elected officials in America. After the National Black Political Convention in Gary, over 10,000 black elected officials in the United States by the end of the 1970s. And you know, as a school board member, I caught a lot of, well, I can't say it again, House of God. But I caught a lot of flack. And one of the things I caught flack over was with this beautiful flag right here. In Swahili, it's called Bandera. Means flag. This is the red, black, and green flag. You know what this flag is? This is the flag of Marcus Garvey. The flag of the United Negro Improvement Association, which had over one million members during the time of Garvey. It was the largest black organization that has ever existed then or now. The United Negro Improvement Association. And, Gary, and this flag appeared at the UNIA convention held at Madison Square Garden in the 1970s. Now, you know, during the 60s and 70s, that was our black cultural renaissance. Amir Barak is known as the father of the black arts movement. And politically, that was the black power period. The Civil Rights Movement was successful in getting the Civil Rights Act passed in 1964 and the Voting Rights Act passed in 1965. But the Black Power Movement implemented the tools that were given to us through the Civil Rights Movement. And all throughout the United States, these cities that had not had any black elected officials but were predominantly black, most of them, mm -hmm. them. They used the vote. And one of the things that began to happen is that we began to do what? When I came in tonight, brother was saying how during that period we wore dashis. Mm -hmm. So I was on my way over here. The reason I'm late is I called, Je Jeffrey called me and said, they're waiting for you, Larry, you got to get over here. I said, I at least said, look good. Then the press is here. I said, oh, I better go home and get my dashi there. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to turn around and go back, get my dashi so we could have the full meaning of Kwanzaa here today. But you ain't got to have no dashi, brothers and sisters. Kwanzaa is in you. That's where Kwanzaa is. The Kwanzaa is in you. You could be, you could be Africa down, have all African clothes on, have an African name, and be as reactionary as Mobutu. <laughs> and you could be in a suit and tie, a regular dress, and be as militant as Malcolm X. Right. It's in you. Right. It's your consciousness that determines your blackness. You know these things help, but it's what's up here. It's what's in here. Black liberation begins here. Right here is where black liberation begins. So when I was on the school board, students came to the meeting one night. They said, we want to be able to bring the red, black, and green flag to our schools because students would bring the teachers and say, you can't bring that in here. The only flag we can have in here is the red, white, and blue. So the students came down to the school board meeting and I proposed a resolution on the spot 
It says students should be able to bring the red, black, and green. I didn't say they had to take down the American flag. I said, student, it's an educational tool. Students should be able to bring this educational tool into the classroom. The whole board voted for it. The next morning, you would have thought the world was coming to, to an end. Newark Board of Education votes to fly the black flag. And then my poor mother would be sitting home watching her story. And the vice president of ABC Television would come on. We interrupt this program. Oh my God, they're flying the black flag in North Public School. And the culprit behind it is Larry Hand. My, my poor mother would be home crying. So what you crying about? So I was catching all this flat. But you know what happened when we went to Gary? You know, Gary had elected Dick Hatch. Man, even before Ken Gibson, they elected the game. Richard Hatcher was very progressive. There's a magazine called Freedom Ways. You should look up some of his articles in Freedom Ways magazine. But I caught all this flat every day. New York Times, Star Legend, ABC, Channel 4, Channel 7, all editorializing against me for bringing the red, black, and green flag in school. We stepped off the plane in Gary. We got in a cab. We went to the place where the convention was held on the main boulevard. Dick Hatcher had a red, black, and green flag flying from every lamppost down the main boulevard in Gary, Indiana. And it was after Gary. You know, I came off a toast. Let me tell you, I used to come out of my house and have to step over people. And if it wasn't drugs, it was alcohol. And the weapon of choice back then wasn't a gun, it was the knife. And Martin was filled up every Friday and Saturday night. You know, I saw the worst in our community, but then I went to Gary, and I saw 10,000 black people who had been elected. They had had conventions at the local, at the county, the city, the state level, and we had all been elected up to the National Black Political Convention again. I had never seen the kind of unity that I saw in Gary. Black people from all walks of life coming together. And what did they do? They hammered out the National Black Political Convention, a whole document of reforms to improve the condition of our people here in the United States. I had never seen such unity, such ujima, collective work and responsibility. I'd never seen that before in my life. And that, for me, was a transfiguring experience. And that's when I asked Amiri Barak to give me an African name. And he gave me the name Abimu Chunga, which means exalted youth. And although I'm not a youth anymore, that will be my name also until the day I die. And I've named my children, my oldest daughter, Laini Buradisha, Swahili for soft, smooth, and refreshing. My middle daughter, Nia Adili, just purpose. And my last daughter, Imani, faith. And my third one, all three of my daughters have attended Rutgers University. And the third one is there now, and I hope she didn't graduate too. You know. Don't be scared, brothers and sisters. Stop being scared. People said, why you got an African name? You not gonna be able to get a job with an African name. <laughs> then when we changed the names of the schools, you know, I met Rosa Parks when I was on the board. And after I met Rosa Parks in August of 1971, I came back and changed the name of Waverly Avenue School to Rosa Parks Elementary School. I didn't meet Harry Tubman, but I changed the name of South 10th Street School to Harry Tubman Elementary School. I didn't meet Martin Luther King, but I changed the name of South 8th Street School to Martin Luther King School. 
And after a young man named Norman Buchanan got a petition drive at Southside High School to change the name of that school, we changed that name to Malcolm X Shabazz High School. And you know what happened? After we changed the name of the school, there was a terrible campaign by teachers and administrators in the school told the students that they wouldn't be able to get into college with Malcolm X on their diploma. That high school sends just as many children to college as all the other high schools in New As all the other high schools in New But this is the fear that we have. The fear and the self-hatred. And that's why Karanga, that must be among the reasons why Karanga created Kaweeda and created the Aguza Saba and created Kwanzaa so that we could come together in the spirit of unity first. What does it say? Family, community, nation, and race. Now I want to talk for a minute, just a minute, about family. See, family is the hardest place it is to build unity. You would think it'd be community. No, family is the hardest place. I can remember I lived in an extended family, and when I had my black consciousness awaken, I come home. First thing, don't bring that black stuff in here. <laughs> I would have to sneak. I had one of them little fold up record players. Remember the kind of fold up? Kind of speakers, 45. I bought the Malcolm X record. I had to go down in the basement to play it. My mother, I'm gonna get that Muslim stuff in my house. The only conversation I actually remember in my own family about Dr. King was when he came out against the Vietnam War, oh, my grandfather said he should stick to civil rights. <laughs> but don't act surprised, you heard the same thing. Family is one of the hardest places, but it is a place where we must struggle to build unity. Amen. And we must start with our own children. And you know how we can start? Start by buying black author books for your children and sitting down with them and reading them. You worry about what the school, yes, we should make our schools do what we want them to do, but you ain't got to wait for the school to try to open your child's eyes and raise your child's consciousness. You can buy your own books and sit down Turn that television off. It's destroying our minds. Turn it off. Turn off that television and turn off that radio. Some of y'all don't even know what a quiet time is. You got to get still sometime and get quiet. So you can hear, and look, don't tell the children, oh, y'all are not reading enough. When the last time they seen you read a book? You can't make your children do something that you're not doing yourself. I don't always get too many claps on that one, but I ain't come here to be your friend. I'm your lecturer tonight. I'm not your friend. I'm your lecturer tonight. No, I'm John the Baptist tonight. No, no. I live in the wilderness. I have on sheep skin and I eat locusts and honey. And I'm, not, I'm not trying to get into the king's court. No, I'm out here with you. That's where I want to be. In the highways and in the byways. We got to go get our people, y'all. We got to go get them. We can't change nothing in this country unless we have unity. Our whole history as a people is a testament to this fact. Slavery existed in the Western Hemisphere 500 years. First, they enslaved the indigenous and perpetrated genocide against them. Whole populations 
wiped out to take their land. And then to work the land, they went and got to Africa. Millions of Africans stolen from the continent. Most of them didn't even make it to the West. They, bones are in the Atlantic over the Middle Passage. Millions of our people brought and forced to work. And if it was just the labor, that would be one thing. But we were not treated as well as cattle. Brought on slave ships. Eric Williams says in the book, Capitalism and Slavery, that a dead man in a coffin had more room than a slave on a slave ship. You've seen the vivid section of that slave ship how the bodies were laid in there like sardines. Many slaves went mad. Some women had babies on the ships and threw their children overboard rather than have them grow up in slavery. Then when we were brought here, families torn apart, put on the auction block, and branded with hot branding iron. Like cat, not permitted to speak our own language at the threat of death. Use the drum at the threat of death. We couldn't even practice our own religion. We were forced to have other religion. I mean, it's true. I'm just stating the fact here. I'm not trying to make an argument against anybody's religion. I'm just telling we couldn't even have our own name. We didn't have a name John and Mary and Sue, Carl Pepper and Johnson and Jacks. Those weren't our names. They took our names. They outlawed our culture. They gave us, some of us, they didn't even give full names. I went, got my family's records from Virginia. Didn't even have last names. The record book, the ledger from the county just had the first name because our last name was our master's name. Just today, I was looking at the newspaper and I saw a picture of George Washington. It's the anniversary of George Washington crossing the Delaware. I would love to be a patriot. I would love to wave the flag. I would love to stand up and say something nice about George Washington. But the only thing I can say is that he was a slave master. The only thing I can say about Jefferson, the flowing words of the Declaration of Independence, Notwithstanding, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are imbued by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and he was the biggest slave master in the state of Virginia. I would love to wave the flag. I would love to be as pay I, I want to have that bond with my country. But every time I move in that direction, there's something in the way. The enslavement of my people for 250 years in the continental United States. Jim Crow for 100 years. And now racial inequality for who knows how long. I will be patriotic when my people are afforded the freedom and human dignity and equality and justice that they deserve, then I'll raise and wave the flag of the United States of America. I remember when we gathered in the Hikalu and Malimu for the first Kwanzaa. And we recited those seven principles. But we also sang a song, a song that was written by Sister Amina Baraka. I think I remember the words. This was 43 years ago. C.C. Watu, Waves, Watu Wazu. Pamoya tu tashinda. Pamoya tu tashinda. We are black and beautiful people, and together we will win. 